Welcome back to the Open Hardware Miniconf. So next up, we have a presentation about Open Hardware Weather Radar. And our speaker is Tisham, who you may have seen previously at an Open Hardware Miniconf. He did a very interesting talk about energy monitoring. And um, if my memory is correct, Tish, you were using FPGAs for that project, I think. Is that correct? I got to a stage where I was like experimenting with them. Yeah, this yep. has a fair bit of FPGAs in it as well. Okay, great. So uh, following on from questions after that last session about what are applications for FPGAs, perhaps um, this is an example. I'm very interested to see this presentation. So Tish, take it away. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so my slides are up. Uh, so I, uh, I'm Tisham. I build things for fun, and uh, this is one of the things I built. And uh, I'll start, uh, before I introduce myself, I will start with an acknowledgement to the country. I'm presenting today from the land of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and I acknowledge their people, the past, present, and current. And the connection to the land and water is very crucial to life. And this presentation, even though it's about hardware, it's really about water. And we'll see a lot of that going through. And uh, yeah, enjoy. Um, so I started uh, building this project many years ago. There's a little bit of a timeline here, but uh, slowly been chipping away at it. and. Uh, I'm at a stage where I need help. And this is in addition to what you have done and learned. It's also about getting this out to the community and getting interest in hardware uh, in RF frequencies uh, uh, bigger and looking at water. That's uh, So there's a bit of a flow of the ideas. I, my mind works in a very random uh, branching fashion and I have to backtrack and linearize it. A presentation by its very nature is very linear. So I've tried to put down all of the different ideas uh, that are, are going to be talked about in a linear fashion. So I will talk a bit about the history of uh, where the radars, where they come from. It's a bit of a superpower uh, seeing things in radar. Uh, we don't really have extra vision or uh, super people these days, but uh, Radar is the closest you can come to extra vision, seeing through walls and clouds into, into the, what's behind. Uh, talk about a bit of uh, ocean in the sky and how the radar interacts with the moisture. Some stuff about solid state radars and where things are at in the commercial industry in this arena. A bit of project uh, timeline of my and my partner Gishini's work on this. So I didn't do all this by myself. I had a lot of help. And uh, all of the rest of it is uh, around how iteratively you try to solve problems. I was watching <laughs> John's presentation on dealing with issues that come about when you're trying to make hardware. Some of the issues when you're trying to get a new idea off the ground are even bigger. they are business issues in making people understand that this is actually worth doing. Uh, and then there is a uh, funding issues uh, is what I'm referring to and a couple of technical issues around now casting and QPE, which stands for quantitative precipitation estimation. And then we get to the actual idea or, or the prototypes I have or been working on for uh, phased array radars. And, uh, and this is not a brand new idea. It's just becoming easier and easier to do with the advances in availability of hardware. Uh, easier for novices and people just sitting in their living rooms to do, I guess, outside a lab. And skies ahead. Hewani is the project name. Hewa means the, what's in the sky, what's the weather like in Swahili. So the skies ahead for this project and all of the turbulence that we would be experiencing or been experiencing. So yeah, so the there's a fair number of slides. There's a lot of words, uh, some pictures. So I'll just go through it and uh, uh, I will keep an eye on the time. Uh, so the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum is what we're talking about. And it's a finite resource. And we have governments uh, licensing out spectrum uh, at very, very high rates. And our modern civilization, like me talking over Wi-Fi right now, is tied together by this part of the spectrum. And only very few people work on it, understand it. It's pretty black magic. Uh, yeah, so that's that's sort of the very interesting area to work in. 
a bit of history of how how these things came about uh, the radios were invented and then the radar itself came from what was a request for a death ray to spray something into the air and take down aircraft during the second world war uh, and the uh, the radar installations came about i became aware in my life journey about radars through reading this book le grand sac uh, by a french uh, free air force pilot Pierre Costema, who later became a politician, who talked about the radar that was being used in the Air Force during the Second War. Uh, so yeah, so that from war, the, after the war ended, there was a lot of radars available, and uh, there were what was the clutter in the wartime radar uh, became signal in the, the, these radars being used for civilian purposes to observe precipitation. Rain surplus military radars form the seed of weather observation radars. So there's an ocean in the sky. Uh, we have so many oceans uh, that where my son reads about, you know, uh, the Arctic, the Antarctic, the, South, the North Atlantic, South Atlantic. There is also an ocean in the sky. All of the evaporation from all of the oceans gathers in the sky, and a lot of our uh, biosphere depends on that ocean in the sky falling down on the land. And the, the reason that we have things like Wi-Fi are due to the weird dance that the water molecule does when excited with frequencies at this, uh, this, uh, this, yeah, with these frequencies and absorbing it, sucking it up, and sometimes reflecting some of it. And uh, we end up with uh, this unlicensed bands where no, people don't want to use it, and we use it for things like Wi-Fi and uh, the ISM bands. The benefits of the weather observation, I will go into more detail, but it it's, uh, affects both the benefit side, that we grow crops and have drinking water, uh, to the risks. Uh, we have, uh, I was living in Canberra, and uh, thousands of cars were turned into what my friend Kelvin refers to as golf balls by the meteors. Hydrometeors, not the, not the space kind. Uh, so uh, I have seen this, uh, I, I learned French in school, so I've seen this saying in English, uh, you know, one man's fish is another man's poison, it didn't really make sense until I learned French, is that poisson is actually fish. Uh, and uh, the, this is because the, what I refer to as the attenuation due to the resonance with water at these frequencies. And this is what you can use for, uh, uh, for the microwave observation of precipitation. So the, given coming from the target observation radars, you have lots of other types of target observation radars. Uh, some of them are marine radars, and they can be turned into weather radars with modifications. But you require specialist labs to make those modifications. And uh, yeah, they're not quite easy to get. You need a whole truck, and it's big. So this one is not uh, like a low, small, low frequency, so uh, high frequency, so it requires a big antenna. They're quite a bit set up. But quite, uh, quite interesting things you can do with uh, all of the target observation radar. So that's sort of history of where we are. Uh, sort of moving forward to the last 10 or 20 years, we have seen uh, things uh, become more, even more compact. Gallium nitride is uh, used for the power amplifier, solid state, instead of magnetrons, which were used in the early radars and were not very disciplined in their frequency generation. So I have a little list of various military modern solid state radars. And then the civilian solid state radars are available too, but they still use a spinning antenna. Uh, so I have a, a few small list of civilian solid state radars that have just been entering the market over the last five years or so. Uh, yeah, I actually went out to the marina to take a picture of one in, in Adelaide. I, my, yeah. Uh, during a family beach time, I'm just staring at radars at the, at the marina. Uh, so yeah, so this is a project timeline of me being, becoming involved in this project, working through various challenges, deploying hardware in, in the field, uh, doing a first presentation on it. So I worked, started working on it uh, with my friend Gishini around 2018. Uh, I visited Kenya, we'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, we deployed sensors. Uh, we sort of, I give a first public presentation about it in Baikon AU, mostly on the DevOps and the software side of it and the infrastructure side of it, of uh, getting the data 
together and uh, sort of disseminating it over Nairobi. Uh, so Nairobi hasn't had a weather radar in the last 30 or so years. Before that, in a place called Karen, there was a big radar installation and it became such that uh, there was no expertise, obviously, in maintaining this a big piece of hardware. And it became unmaintained and there the government has been trying to do a new budgetary requir request to set up a new one. And they, if you want to do a, one big lumpy one, you end up with millions of dollars and a uh, sub-Saharan country just doesn't have the oomph to do, pull it off. Uh, so yeah, so that's sort of we saw a need and we ideated, we deployed stuff, we talked about it, I talked about it. Um, Gishin is a very private person, uh, he doesn't like talking about these things too much. Uh, the, uh, I've been trying to stabilize stuff over the last year, I've taken various breaks between jobs and written a bunch of code to improve the stuff from how it was, runs on serverless now. Now I'm sort of working again on the hardware side uh, to create new versions which are cheaper, easier to deploy, require less maintenance, are more open uh, compared to what we have now. Uh, and sort of uh, maybe in a few years, maybe uh, hardware is hard, someone will pay us for it, or uh, there will be a big market where everyone is making them and we can buy them cheaper than we can make them ourselves, which is sort of, even though the gray market for Arduinos is huge these days in AliExpress, um, it's great for people in other parts of the world, like say India or Kenya, it's a financially really good op option for a cheap hardware to become available that people can learn outside outside uh, of what they can afford, yeah. So, uh, so this is sort of the loop, uh, again, I'm reminded of John's talk of uh, prototyping, trying something out, um, uh, sharing about it, getting some learning new things, getting feedback, refining your ideas and uh, trying going again, uh, keep, just keep doing it. The cost of iterating on hardware is higher, time costs are higher, it's a slow cycle. So you make small changes and you put on, yeah, instead of getting a new stencil made, you put on captain tape where you need to uh, hack things together, have bodge wires. Um, it's, uh, it's how hardware is done. Uh, it, it's not pretty. I was iterating on my background this morning to get it in the good white balance. It's a real world, changing the real world is hard. So I have to run off and get some you know, uh, dark paper to fix it. Um, I could have done it in software, but uh, I, I'm a hardware person, I guess. So yeah, so one of the challenges we had was um, getting started, bootstrapping, and getting a little bit of money to get started. Uh, so the top picture is uh, me and my friend Gishini in a Matatu, which are like uh, local uh, small minivans, uh, typically Toyota, Toyotas, uh, that take people around at the back of it. We are going, going to some place called Lamu, which is like a few kilometers from the Somali border and is famous for kidnapping tourists. But anyway, uh, and then uh, we sort of uh, put this idea together. So Yishini is super smart. He went to MIT. He got into some, got us some contacts. Uh, the major of them was Greg. Greg uh, runs the microwave sensing course at MIT. I've got a few props here. So one of the courses that Greg runs uh, uses uh, containers uh, uh, to build a small short range uh, radar, which you can generate images from using synthetic apertures. You should check out, it's an open course. You should check out that stuff that Greg has. Um, yeah, and uh, he advised us um, we needed uh, some money to build some stuff. So Ray Stata, who is a founder uh, and uh, for a while the CEO of Analog Devices, uh, very high speed uh, analog sensing uh, instruments maker. He talked to us, uh, said, what are you planning to do in three years? Uh, we wrote down on one page. He spoke to us for five minutes and he gave us uh, a bit of money to do, do some crazy things, try out some crazy things. Um, so yeah, so that was how we got started on this idea. Uh, so the upsides that we did sell to people was, uh, you know, the rain is uh, uh, is I is vital for how we grow food. The upsides of knowing, predicting when it will be, uh, will, are you gonna get decent amounts of it? So you can see the graph of the rainfall versus food production here due to rain-fed agriculture. Uh, 
Uh, and then on the flip side, the damages caused by unexpected precipitation events are, uh, are there. There's a very good site from NOAA called Billions. And you can see billions of dollars of losses due to weather related events, flooding, hail that the US experiences. Uh, yeah, so there is a good case for doing it. We can't really control the weather. We can observe and move people to safety. Uh, so that's one of the things you can do, or you can estimate insurance losses or risk of looking forward. Insurance works on the principle of the insurance industry knowing the risks slightly better than the people being insured and uh, uh, benefiting of that gap. Um, yeah, so that's sort of the benefits of better precipitation observation. So that's the first part of getting going and getting some funding in and convincing people that this is worth doing. Maybe uh, uh, it's already being done by states, like the nation states uh, in the Western world. It's just, uh, uh, it's worth doing for a place like Africa as well. So the next challenge, which uh, I guess uh, came as uh, creating a, something cool. Uh, the project started, we got the idea initially when I was like watching soccer. It's uh, Premier League is pretty big. And uh, in Kenya, I was watching soccer at a pub. And whenever the rain would come, the satellite broadcast would like fade away due to rain fade, obviously. And I was like, oh, it's gonna, I know where the satellite is. Uh, it's probably gonna rain in five minutes. And other people watching the thing with me at the bar were like, how are you doing that? Uh, so that sort of uh, that sort of five minute prediction is easier. But uh, if you want to do 90 minutes and so it will take years of research to do it. So first of the challenge, one of the challenges we looked at was now casting. And that requires uh, a large sampling window and uh, creating a grid of these sensors. Uh, I have in here uh, radar data simulation and now casting paper from one of the many research papers going around. This one is particular one is in Catalonia. Uh, so we got to some stage. We got to a sort of 20 minute window now casting approach. I'm uh, just going to talk a little bit more about the, the way it's, it works in, uh, in a properly deployed scenario. So you need typically you need big lumpy radars like uh, the Bureau of Meteorology has in various different wavelengths, each with their own advantages. Uh, Bureau of Met in Australia has things with up to 200 kilometers in coverage. After that, the curvature of the Earth, again, as we will discuss, um, you know, just a slide, a couple of slides down, uh, starts affecting the big lumpy radar. Uh, you can also have what I call the pie in the sky, uh, very high, high risk uh, systems which can blow up regularly. So one of the, some of these meteorological satellites have blown up while being launched. Uh, so you put, you make a baby for years and it costs millions and then you put it on a firecracker and you try to send it to space. It's, it's a high risk venture, but no, we're still doing it. Um, and then uh, sort of uh, the, all the whole big picture uh, requires some of this for stitching the things you're seeing on the ground. It gives us a good big picture view. Uh, this is sort of the history of the various meteorological satellites that are going, have been up. My, I love this last one, Severi. Uh, the Severi uh, has a spinning uh, approach uh, with a mirror for observing the uh, a hemisphere, getting a disk image. Uh, there is an animation on the UMETSAT website of how Severi composites this image. It's really, really cool. It's really cool with a spinning mirror. And then uh, you can have this sort of honeycomb approach, which is what we aimed for in our project uh, in putting together cell of uh, networks, depending on density, depending on the uh, importance, I guess, from a human perspective. So you don't want to have lots and lots of uh, dense X-band radars in an area where there are not many people. A 200 kilometer one would be fine. So this sort of approach is quite common in weather simulations. There is a, one of the models I was looking at called MPASS uses a multi-grid approach rather than an even grid. It uses a multiple different density grids to crea create a, uh, a lower data volume, but still quite accurate weather model, weather simulation model. Uh, so many, many years ago, uh, while I was still doing my PhD, one of the other projects also being run out of my lab by my uh, PG supervisor Doug Gray was this thing called the REN. Uh, so this was run out of the Adelaide University. Uh, I'm not quite sure where it is at. I've been out of the lab for many years now. 
uh, but it sort of also inspired the work we did uh, was to where the radar experimental network which was essentially the same idea, taking small radars and then joining them together into a, into a network to get rid of what the what Bureau of Meteorology talks about, the earth curvature effect of the big lumpy radar. So it gives you better microclimate estimations, uh, higher resolutions, temporal, spatial, and uh, yeah, takes care, of, takes care of the curvature. The earth is not flat. Uh, the REN project was supported by uh, Raytheon's uh, phased array radar, uh, uh, so which is not again commercially available. Uh, so yeah, so that again, my attempt at this uh, ongoing is to develop something that is not a uh, military system and is fairly open so that we can uh, create more of them. Uh, so the other challenge is uh, what I had in my uh, stream as a QPE, quantitative precipitation estimation. Uh, the QPE challenge for is addressed in, say, I have a paper, this, uh, this as a reference paper, relatively recent, a year or so ago from Taiwan, um, uh, is uh, uh, you need lots of ground truth because the rain moves around by the wind uh, and where you observe it in, in the space may not be where it lands. Uh, but the source data available to perform QPE over Africa is very sparse and they don't agree with each other. Uh, the various data sources are Tahmo, Tamsat, uh, the, a couple of weather models, GEFs, ECMWF. Uh, their resolutions are very different to the sensor that uh, we are using. And uh, the inversion problem uh, becomes intractable without good data to tie it to. The Taiwan paper, which was fairly successful, uh, is, uh, uh, uses a network of 1,000 stations uh, for automated weather stations. So there is another piece of hardware that needs to be built and made much more commodity, which is automated weather stations. Um, 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 this is an open hardware at Minicom, so it's another, another prop for it's another piece of hardware that needs to exist to solve this problem better. Uh, the, another fun fact about Taiwan, uh, apparently part of the silicon supply chain issue is due to reduced rain in the mountains of Taiwan, reducing supply of fresh water. So uh, if you are not seeing chip shortages, there is the rain is causing it. Less rain is causing it. Uh, so the, 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 the in uh, absence of the ground truth, so one of the things I looked at is, and I would like to introduce here, is the, this concept of precipitation air RCS. Oh, that's a duplication, radar RCS. It's just RCS, uh, radar cross-section. I have to fix up the slide. But anyway, uh, the teardrop shape that you have in all of the emojis of rain is not true. The rain doesn't form a teardrop. It uh, forms this thing, which is like an inverted goblet, which comes to closest to the teardrop shape uh, when it gets pretty big, but it never is a teardrop. It looks like a flattened ball. It looks like more like an orange when it's falling down due to the pressure of the air on, on the raindrop. Only when it's very small, it's a sphere because the surface tension of the water but as it, as it gets bigger and due to the wind velocity, it starts distorting, the, it, it's, its shape is never a teardrop, which is quite interesting. Um, and then the, the other type of RCS you have to get is for the hailstones I was discussing about in, uh, in Canberra. Uh, the, this is a pretty funky one. I like it because it looks almost like a virus. Um, this one is created by, uh, by the super cooled water spinning and pushing off little cones as it spins. And those cones freeze into place, and uh, the, the uh, but usually it's like a water ice mixed with sometimes air bubbles in it. So you're creating the dielectric for hydrometeors is quite hard. Um, anyway, so it's a, it's another interesting precipitation if you want to compute the RCS uh, using simulations instead of using uh, ground station data. And the other one uh, type of RCS or precipitation form is FOX, which you can just use small spheres uh, to calculate. I've been experimenting with another open source uh, software project called MEEP uh, from MIT also, uh, which looks at this uh, quite cool. Uh, it has a Python API. You can create objects and then uh, throw radar at it to see what the backscatter looks like, which is quite cool. And this is my favorite good looking one uh, that I have added here a sample for a Cox, uh, 
uh, fractal based uh, uh, no notebook for creating ice crystals that uh, Grok Learning has. It's, it's very cool. I had a lot of fun playing around with it. Um, yeah, so sometimes it's just fun uh, you doing some of these things and looking at the shapes that water forms. Uh, so this is the open hardware radar presentation. I'm fairly into my time, uh, but I will, I will go over it. Uh, I have bits of kit to show. Uh, so the idea is essentially instead of having a big antenna that spins like we saw in the other uh, one of the historical uh, notes, uh, you create a panel with lots of antennas in it and you can steer in one direction, not physically but electronically. Uh, so it requires a bunch of software defined radios, uh, frequency doublers, uh, in my case because I only have like 5-6 gigahertz radios. Uh, power amplifiers, uh, antenna arrays, um, those are the basic building blocks. Uh, there's a nice write-up. This image is from uh, uh, Toshiba Research on this. Again, as I said, most of this stuff happens in a lab, and is I would love to see it moving towards open hardware community and becoming much more commonplace. So these are the couple of things I've tried. Uh, there's an FPGA here, an Ultra Cyclone 4, uh, Lime SDR, I have a few of these. Uh, I'm trying to get one of these blade RFs. Uh, they are quite expensive. Uh, this also has an FPGA, but next generation up from the Lime SDR, the Cyclone 5 FPGA. Um, there is a frequency doublers, which uh, I contacted Lime SDR about, and they said a tier one customer has bought all of them. So it's not available. So I'd love to see what this tier one customer is doing. So I have a PCB here. Um, which is essentially the PCB you have in the slide. Um, it feed, it has its frequency doubling output feeds and our transmit and receive channels. Uh, it will be quite interesting to see what, how, how we go. Uh, the next one is the uh, like a passive frequency doubler. So this one has an active chip on it, uh, but this one is a passive frequency doubler, which uh, which you can get as well. But you have a bit of signal loss. I have ordered a couple of these to experiment with as well. Uh, so then the next part is the hardest to get stuff because it will be spraying real power into the air as the power amplifiers. So stay within low powers. Um, uh, 60 watt amps you cannot get because you need to sign 10,000 forms to say you're not going to do anything naughty with them. Uh, but 35 watt or so maybe you'll still have to sign forms and you can get those uh, GAN power amplifiers. And then this is a fun bit, like I was talking about the, the CAN array. So I was been messing around creating antenna arrays. Uh, there are existing designs you can get of the MIMO antenna arrays. Uh, you can, at 5.8 gigahertz, you can pick up your standard Wi-Fi antenna arrays and work, work with those. Uh, so this is like uh, created uh, using uh, FreeCAD and I'm planning to put some antenna designs uh, off the shelf and my own into FICO, which is a tool I used uh, for uh, MEMS-based uh, antenna simulation to see how they behave. Uh, this is what a realistic antenna would look like uh, for sending and receiving and so on. Uh, so yeah, so that's sort of uh, the last part of the open hardware approach that I'm working on. I don't have completed hardware. I have got like lots of parts. I've got like a you know, bunch of cables to put into my rubber ducts. Uh, but I haven't got a full build yet, but uh, I would love to see people contact me and collaborate on that. So the skies ahead are pretty turbulent <laughs> for our project. Uh, we have uh, sort of run uh, through the angel funds that we had, doing learning various things, experimenting. Uh, funding for building something in Africa is challenging. People don't see any clear path to revenue. Uh, operating with these things outside a cleared lab in a Western world is challenging a little bit. Uh, so that's that's quite interesting in balance. In Africa, we can reach out to people. I have seen the head of the meteorological department, uh, uh, assistant director or in Kenya, and pitched our idea and got some support, of some some pushback and corruption as well. But yeah, so it's, that will be a higher bar to do in Australia. Uh, the operating environment in Africa is difficult, building hardware, getting stuff shipped in is difficult. And I would love to see open source hardware and software community jump in with their resources to put together a good set of things that can be that can be relatively affordably built into a large array. So to, in order to build an antenna array like this, you would require you know, hundreds of SDRs. 
not hundreds, yeah, perhaps hundreds, yeah. Uh, when in my lab, also in the lab, we built a 100 antenna GPS passive radar. So you could bounce GPS off an aeroplane and see, use that as a radar. So it requires a lot of, lot of uh, RF, RF signal chain stuff. Yeah, so I would love to see the open source hardware and software community dive deeper into the RF land. And thank you for listening. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, I think that went went well for a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I was I've been making this presentation after John asked me to do it over a few few weeks, and I was hanging out whenever I would have free moment. I would hang out, uh, and uh, one of the people who saw me writing this presentation wrote me a poem, so I have it in there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Thank you, Tish. That was very interesting. Um, now, we're pretty much on the limit for time here, but we do have a couple of questions, which hopefully um, <laughs> uh, will be brief. And the first one is calling back to what you were just mentioning a moment ago. Um, you were talking about GPS um, reflectometry. And one of the questions in the chat is, do you do any work with passive reception of reflected noise? The RF component of rain noise can be received, but I don't know how directional it is, fairly broadband. Yeah, yeah. So some of the ideas are there uh, uh, for using rain fade as well. Uh, so if you have a good uh, number of uh, cell towers or things like that, or you can measure the rain fade using passive receive mode only. And then you have to, again, go back and invert all of that into the actual body of the rain. And the reflectivity is uh, it scatters. So you have to do it's a, quite a difficult inversion problem. If you have control over the radiator, it's an easier, easier problem to solve. Okay. And um, another question is, do any of the marine radars work with Linux? Ah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. So uh, the marine radars uh, ship with their own hardware. Uh, so some of the, you have to break into the signal chain. I uh, spent an, an amount of time sitting on um, Wireshark. Uh, they have Ethernet going over the protocols and stuff. Uh, I haven't opened. Uh, any of that yet? It's not very. I'm not sure what the <laughs> legal ramifications of uh, reverse engineering these things is yet. I don't yeah. have. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer. Issues, anyway. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they work over Ethernet. So once a driver is built and the uh, Ethernet protocol is reverse engineered, you could make them work. Hmm. Okay. I would love help there. Send uh, if please privately send me something. I'll send you some Wireshark capture packets. Yeah. Um, there was, <laughs> we are really pushing for time, but no, two more quick questions. One is, would these radars be useful for people running solar power plants? Interesting. Um, so if you ha want to see real time quick response, so if you want to see rain clouds arriving over the horizon beyond the predictions that Bureau of Met provides you, uh, then you would want to do this yourself. Bureau of Met, I've spoken to Jaya from after my previous presentation at Bureau of Met. And Bureau of Met is about to release, after many years of research, a uh, 90 minute now casting uh, service, which they, it takes them five minutes to assimilate and run the radar, and then they can look forward 90 minutes, which is fairly accurate. So maybe rather than hosting your own, uh, in Australia especially, you could use the BOMS. BOM is an excellent science agency. You could use BOMS service. Yeah, okay. Um, well, we better wrap it up, but just before you go, if people want to follow up on this and they want to learn more about your project, is there a particular place they should look? Um, there is a Twitter bot that we built as part of this uh, called Hewan AKE, which has been gone silent. I haven't been able to maintain it. Uh, so you can look at Hewan AKE's previous updates over Nairobi. So Hewan is what is in the air, KE in Kenya. So it uh, give, tweets mm -hmm. out the rain in uh, Nairobi. And you can also reach me on Twitter on Watnik is the social media I'm most active in. Yeah, great. That's fantastic. Well, thanks, Tish. I really appreciate you coming along. And uh, this has been a very interesting thing. And a couple of people in the chat also mentioned, I really liked the imagery of the ocean in the sky that you mentioned at the start. <laughs> <Very solid. laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. See you. Bye.